Ladies and gentlemen, Hebrews and Shebrews, welcome to the Life Podcast. Today we are talking with probable genius John Sherman. He he's gonna kill me for saying this. <laughs> but he is the big fat engineering brain behind 119 Ministries. He was a systems engineer, and you're gonna learn all about his background and how it plays into how he approaches the Bible and studying it, and why that's been so beneficial to so many people around the world. Um, so he doesn't really need an introduction, because I think most of you guys have heard of 119 Ministries, but that's not all he is doing. We're going to talk to him about uh, an indoor hydroponic greenhouse, like, state-of-the-art operation that he was running, and we're going to talk to you about his nutrition business, which has cured Parkinson's disease. He'll also kill me for saying that, but it paused his symptoms and reversed them, and has done the same for many other people. Without further ado, I present to you John Sherman. John, thank you so much for being on the Life Podcast. <laughs> thank you. It's good to see you again. Thanks for taking the time. It's yeah. been seven years. Yeah, how long has it been? Seven was or it, eight years. Yeah, was it 2015 or so? I, yes, I think. so eight years, yeah, I think. Yeah, okay. I can't believe it. Since I've seen you in person. I know, right? Yeah. So. And it wasn't here. It was in, in Costa, Costa Rica. Costa Rica, yeah. Oh my gosh. Should we jump right into... Well, let's jump right into that, can we? Okay. Just to, We'll skip that first question and we'll jump into what has happened to you since our last interview. Yeah. <laughs> Whew. Well, that's a, a spread of time there, is it not? Um, so 2015, we were still living in Gracia, Costa Rica, uh, and we did live in Costa Rica for some time after that, about two or three years. Uh, Costa Rica really kind of ended up serving the purpose that it was originally intended for, which is to kind of give us, Steve and I, uh, a means to uh, mitigate expenses and, uh, and, and run 118 Ministries in that capacity. But uh, we started kind of running into some kind of things that were unanticipated long term. And, uh, there's some challenges in living in Costa Rica. I, I, living with any foreign country, there's always going to be challenges. But uh, those challenges continue to increase. It just started being more difficult as an expat to live in Costa Rica. The the cost mitigation wasn't, you know, there, and the expenses were growing. And it seemed like Costa Rica is trying to uh, to to make things more difficult for for expats. Um, and our kids were getting older. Um, and when kids get older, you start thinking about the long term. We kind of started to realize, my wife and I that uh, if, the, if our kids were 18 years of age, would they still be living in Costa Rica? The idea is probably not. They would move back to the United States for this reason or that reason. And uh, then Les and I were like, well, what would we do? We wouldn't want to be in Costa Rica if our kids were in the United States, so why are we here now if that's kind of the end game? So, um, and then, uh, and we'll probably talk about this more in the interview, but I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease a few years earlier and I started taking different kinds of supplements and things to kind of help out with that. And I had some success, but Costa Rica made it insanely difficult to get supplements in some ways to, to Costa Rica. We found some workarounds and those workarounds were starting to fail. And uh, it was actually, they, they treated, uh, it was actually easier to walk into a pharmacy and get whatever you wanted from their pharmacy uh, without doctor's permission, but trying to bring in your own supplements, they, they treat it as like it was a uh, first class drug. <laughs> uh, so uh, in some cases, so uh, that made it difficult to actually do the kind of treatment or self treatment for Parkinson's that I was looking for. So that was a, a long term problem that didn't seem to have any solution in, in front of us. So with all those things kind of adding up and, and, uh, and you know, with being uh, a gringo, as you would say in Costa Rica, uh, and Steve was there, so he would say the same thing. He's like, you're constantly kind of targeted, not in a bad way, but um, uh, it, it's not uncommon for if you, if you leave your house that there's a possible chance that when you leave your house, you'll come back, there'll be nothing in it. And that happened to us at least once there. Uh, so uh, they're, they're the risk for those kinds of things increased as well. And I was just kind of, you know, with all those kind of just put into a bucket, I just said, hey, it's kind of time to move back to the United States. So. That, that is what we did, um, and uh, so to kind of answer your question, from the time from 2015 till uh, the time we moved back, I guess that was about beginning of 2018, end of 2017, that we moved to uh, Florida, Tampa, Florida. Uh, we followed some friends uh, to Florida, and, and, uh, and they're still there, um, but we lived in Florida for a, a couple of years, and, 
And one of the, I guess one of the things that was, and this was a kind of a problem in Costa Rica as well, we had fellowship in Costa Rica, which we didn't expect. When Steve and I moved to Costa Rica, we're like, well, that's it. We'll never see anyone again, especially anyone not tour-minded. Uh, but when we moved to Costa Rica, all of a sudden you start finding all these English-speaking people, uh, which made the, proved it difficult to actually learn Spanish <laughs> because we're talking to everyone in, in English. We moved to Florida. Yeah. Uh, we spent a couple of years there. And one of the things that was kind of a challenge as well is that we didn't really ever find fellowship. And I know that in the tour community, that's always a struggle, right? Uh, that how do, you, how do you find people that are like-minded, that, keep, that follow the Torah? And that's a big deal. Um, and actually, I didn't really realize how big of a deal it was until more recently. And I kind of get into that, I guess, during this interview. But uh, well, we moved to Florida. We did find uh, a couple congregations that were, were nice to attend. But um, our, our biggest interest was finding uh, like-minded children that our kids could connect to. Um, and uh, our, our, while our kids were thriving in Costa Rica in a lot of ways, one of the things they weren't having a lot of it was exposure to other, other children. And we didn't see that being a great thing long term. Um, that we, were, we felt like we were kind of, uh, they were kind of missing out on some experiences that they really should have. So, uh, uh, so one of the things in, in moving to Florida and, and kind of realizing, hey, we're not really getting uh, the complete package of fellowship that we're looking for. And uh, given the nature of what I do, um, I do a few things, uh, we run a nutrition company, run YNAT Ministries and, and other things. It's all uh, remote work. Um, so uh, just like we moved to Costa Rica because it was remote work, uh, we didn't have to stay in Florida. So we started thinking, well, where, where can we find fellowship? And, uh, and then we had some other projects that were in our mind as well. So where, where can we go that would kind of fit everything that we're, we're thinking about what we need for positioning for the future? And, uh, and Steve, he had, he had moved to Arkansas. And uh, he did that. Uh, he actually moved from Costa Rica for a lot of the same reasons um, and some personal ones as well. Um, about six months, maybe a year before we did. And, uh, and he moved to uh, the Northwest Arkansas region. And I was familiar with the fact that he had uh, kind of done the same format or Bible study that we did in Costa Rica. And that we also did um, in the States before we even moved to Costa Rica. And, uh, and uh, it, was, it was turned out pretty well. So uh, Les and I and took the kids and we made a trip up to Arkansas and, and met with Steve. And also I'm like, wow, there's so many people here. It's amazing. And, uh, and we actually were just overwhelmed with how many people uh, follow the Torah here. And uh, what, what we were expecting a, a little bit of like a small group, but it's just, it's just now, we're, now we've got an opposite problem. Our opposite problem is like there's too many people <laughs> and we're just constantly busy. Uh, like my, my wife today, I was, and last night was actually coming, like commenting like how she's got no evening free this week just because of everything that's going on. So, uh, so any, anyway, sometimes we actually have to kind of pull back a little bit, which is the exact opposite problem we had before. We had nothing to do sometimes as far as fellowship goes. So uh, we moved to the Arkansas area after uh, uh, meeting with Steve and, and seeing him again, which was, was, was great. And uh, we've been here since, uh, I guess that was June of 21. So it was right kind of after COVID uh, stopped. So that's basically in a nutshell, uh, the timeline of everything's kind of transpired from a personal and family perspective. And uh, there's a lot of things we could probably comment on as far as the ministry, ministry perspective too, but. Oh, I'm curious about so many things there. I, I want to go back to the questions, but part of me wants to ask more about. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, your, it's your story here, so. And I'm also curious, which, I know that you had this, I'm curious about the greenhouse. Yeah, okay. You yeah. had a greenhouse. Katie saw this picture on Facebook of, I think, your son in this space age looking. Yeah. Indoor. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Growing. So, yeah, I could, I, could, I could talk a little bit more about that. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, Leslie was talking to you earlier about how many times we've moved before in the past, right? So, uh, uh, and Nate was saying, hey, hey we're kind of like nomads. We're trying to get, get better at that. This is actually the, where we've been now. It's like the longest we've lived anywhere. Um, which has been about two and a half years. Uh, so uh, we're, we're, when we move, we, we try to move for a reason. We feel like, hey, you know, why does you know, God want us in this particular area or what does he want us to do? But uh, when we moved to Arkansas, we had some, some things in mind as to what we wanted to do. We wanted a little bit of property and we couldn't get that in Florida because it was too expensive. But in Arkansas, property is a lot more affordable. And we wanted some property because one, we just wanted to kind of get kind of closer to like like farming actually and then when we start looking into farming like what's this hydroponic stuff and a friend of ours had some experience with with that and uh, kind of uh, suggested that hey, maybe we should look at hydroponic farming kind of like far like you mentioned farming of the future right and um, so we did uh, and actually we got a, a specially made uh, shipping container um, and uh, called a freight farm 
And the reason I wanted to do that was twofold. One is I run a nutrition business uh, that helps people with Parkinson's disease. And I needed to take some of the proceeds and kind of reinvest that into something that was a little more diversified than just still kind of focusing only on that. And uh, as I already mentioned, our kids were getting older. They're of, of working age. Well, we live in a town that there's not many people around. There's not many jobs. And not only that, you don't know what kind of exposure you're giving to kids and, and different jobs these days. So I wanted to kind of uh, have a little bit more control over kind of what their working experience would be like. So I was like, I'll create a business for them. So it all kind of worked out really well. Um, and uh, so Caitlin and Tyler, uh, they basically ran the show. They were our, our little farm hands uh, for a hydroponic farm. And it was really cool because uh, there's no soil. Um, it was all climate controlled on the inside and we could produce about 4,000 heads of lettuce um, uh, every single month. And uh, it's really quality lettuce. Like the, 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 the lettuce lasts uh, sometimes two to three weeks because uh, you can harvest it with its roots. Um, the, the, uh, the taste of the different uh, leafy greens and, and herbs that we could grow was uh, superior to like your store-bought stuff because you can control the nutrition, the climate, and the amount of oils and stuff that are present in, in, those, in those types of things are much more substantial to the point where chefs, we found, don't have to use as much and they can kind of get away with uh, 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 using less herbs and for the same effect. So we, we did exactly that. We got it started up. We were, we were serving two uh, restaurants, two chefs in downtown Bentonville. And, uh, and it was a lot of fun. Um, now, we don't do that anymore, and that was just because, uh, uh, probably a couple of reasons. One is, uh, I did kind of see the writing on the wall that Walmart's kind of getting into that business as well. They've been partnering with a, an organization called Plenty, and they're transforming these big, huge warehouses to basically just scaling up what we were doing. And since we live in Walmart capital of the world, uh, we, we uh, you know, Bentonville, Arkansas, uh, it, it didn't maybe make sense to continue scaling that up on our end. Uh, because at some point uh, that's going to be a very difficult operation to compete in. You don't compete against Walmart, especially not me. That's not, my, not something I'm capable of doing. And secondly, um, and thankfully so, uh, our, some of our family moved to uh, the, the northwest Arkansas region. Um, and it's a little bit of a distance from here uh, where we're currently located, but we want, so we want to get a little closer to them, uh, which means we had to move the farm. So uh, uh, the farm was more like a short-term uh, and interesting project for about a year and a half. Um, but uh, uh, it is it is a fascinating enterprise, and um, and if someone does have some uh, want to get involved with it, I, I wouldn't discourage them to do it. It's just if if it was the only thing I was doing, it probably would have been a lot easier. But since I'm connected to so many different projects and so many different things, it was kind of really difficult to uh, to uh, kind of keep that running. Was it hard to make the connection with chefs? It was that probably I'm highly introverted, so actually it really did take me out of my comfort zone uh, because uh, while Tyler and Caitlin could manage the maintenance and harvests and the cultivation and all that uh, 100%, which is about 95% of the work, uh, they were not legally allowed to make deliveries, and uh, even more so, they're not going to go out and start talking to a chef and convince a chef that, hey, you want to buy our lettuce? So that was my job. And um, so I actually had to go out and talk, you know, with basically just these aren't warmed chefs at all. They, I'm presenting myself with no his, history with them whatsoever. So uh, I was very nervous at that first, but uh, yeah, actually it's what's interesting is chefs are always looking at improving what they can offer. And since we knew that we had a quality uh, produce that we could offer, um, they, and I would just show up with it, they would literally just start tasting. In fact, I had one chef, um, it was a, a chef, a chef uh, from the restaurant called Conifer, and it was a, a new upcoming kind of urban um, restaurant, and uh, he was a fascinating guy. He, he took the lettuce, and he literally just took it in his palm, and he smashed it in his palm. I'm wondering, like, what is he doing? Because, like, I'm a little green, if you will, to this whole process myself, and this is one of the first chefs I'm having experience with. I'm like, why is he smashing the lettuce in his hand? And uh, I guess what he was trying to uh, emulate was the fact that he uses a lot of acids in his dressings, uh, for, uh, and, that, and that would cover. So that would wilt the lettuce after some time. So what he's trying to do is see how much uh, the the really the lettuce could take and not really compromise its texture and its taste. And that's what he's doing. He's smashing it in. So he'd find a, a couple of varieties that suited him really well uh, using that process. But so there is there is things like that that you know when the, when I got connected to a chef here and there, they would either say, hey, you know, we're not really looking for anybody right now, and they'd be really nice about it, or like, hey, yeah, show me what you got, and uh, let's, see, let's see if we can make it work. So, and actually, when we closed up shop, they were kind of begging us to kind of stay, and I was like, you know, and actually, we had the ability to grow, but again, long-term, and, and with the different projects and our, our current circumstances, it just wasn't going to work out. 
but there was a couple more restaurants in the downtown Bentonville area that actually were connected to other chefs and word started gaining around and so you could have grow, you could have possibly there was the possibility of growth yeah yeah there was a possibility of growth and ironically i kind of mentioned walmart as a competitor but in some ways they actually had the potential of being uh, partnering with us too we had a guy that is familiar with the freight farm said also had a connection with walmart and in our area walmart was is doing these like you probably heard amazon doing these with the drone deliveries and what they were looking at doing is creating and they they contacted us and nothing came out of it because uh, we dissolved the farm but what they're looking at is these these drones could actually come and drop off uh, seeds to us, and then we'd we'd plant the seeds, harvest them about four weeks later, and the drone would come back and pick up a 10-pound package of our uh, produce away and bring it back to Pea Ridge, Arkansas, which is about, um, I guess as the crow flies, it might be about five or six miles away. But you can see the drones uh, taking off as you're driving by too, because they deliver uh, as uh, packages and things like to to local consumers. But uh, that was one way that they're going to try to uh, increase the, uh, the, usage the, 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 use, the usage of the drones was, was uh, through farming. And, and actually, and then the Walmart, of course, gains the, the reputation of using local farmers and things like that, which was a value add uh, for a lot of the chefs in the area and, and, and other consumers. So uh, nothing came out of that, but it would have been really cool like to see a big, huge drone like, appear in your land, uh, your land and, and, and cart off a whole bunch of your produce and it just keeps coming back and forth and stuff like that. So. This episode of The Life Podcast is brought to you by The Way Documentary, The Truth, Reformation 2.0 Apologetics Book, and Truth Tracks. The Way Documentary tells the story of our movement. This is the story of people who were trading Easter ham for Passover lamb and Sunday church for Saturday Sabbath, all in an effort to live like their savior. It dives into their stories through their own voices and into the history and theology that show how the church got to where it is today. The Truth, Reformation 2.0 is the only book of its kind, an all-encompassing theological treatise that answers every question a mainstream Christian might have about why you want to keep Torah. And finally, Truth Tracks are small comics beautifully illustrated that use stories and scripture to remind Christians that once we are saved by grace through faith, we are called to live and do the instructions of Yah, His Torah. If you want to learn more about any of these products, go to thewaydoc.com. That's the way, D-O-C, like documentary, dot com. Do you think that your son will continue in like business? Do you think he'll start another business? Have you talked to him about this? Well, okay. yeah, yeah I, I think so. I mean, he he's, my son's really good uh, at kind of, micromanaging things he, he likes to he likes to kind of get into that level of detail more so than i would I, i'm not uh, the best person when it comes to detail we have person even the 118 ministries team that help cover that deficiency in me uh, because i'm not really great at i'm more high level um, but uh, i i can see that he would kind of there are certain aspects of certain businesses that he would actually perform really well in. and so he's kind of talked about that now right now he's actually applying at a candy shop because they had a job opening and, and it's a family-run business and, and they look really kind of cool so uh, he's that's how he's kind of getting back into employment since I closed down the business for him but uh, uh, at some point I, I think he would get into something like that that's cool yeah that's cool I, I'd like to well I'll go to the next question here all right all right What's the thing in your life right now that you have to actively put down so you can rest on Shabbat? And how do you do that practically, transitioning to Shabbat mode? Mm, that's a great I question. I know it's a shift of gear. That is, no, no, that's, that's a great question. Um, man, uh, I, I, I do know that as the week closes, I get to the point where like, I really need the Shabbat. I really need to rest. I really need to spend time with the, my family. I need to spend time with God. And I need to get into you know, the fellowship that we talked about. And the problem is I have a hard time kind of turning off my brain. I, I, I feel like I, I get really consumed with getting worried about different things and the things that I'm trying to do and the things that I should be doing. But when it comes to Shabbat, I'm still thinking about those things and I feel like I shouldn't be. So uh, quite honestly, in, in moving to this region, and it kind of goes back to what we've been looking for in the first place is that when you know when we went to the tour family which is uh, which is the uh the fellowship that steve uh basically runs. he'll tell you he would say yeah, he doesn't run it but he does he, he runs tour family but uh uh when we when we go there for fellowship that is kind of what i need it, it it enables me to kind of start talking with others even though i don't want to because it's i'm introverted but it does uh, allow me to say hey i need to stop thinking about 
my work or, or, or other things I'm trying to do or different projects and kind of gets me into connecting with other people. And I think that's kind of important. That's cool. That, yeah, that's, that's a challenge for everyone to stop what they're doing and embrace this day of rest. Right, because you're used to going full steam ahead throughout the whole week and how do, how do you, it's not something that you, should, you almost have to cognitively, consciously do that. And, uh, and, uh, and if I don't, I, I find that I am starting to think about things that I'm like, you know, this isn't, this isn't the, time, uh, the, the time of the week that to be thinking about these things. So I, have to, I do have to kind of force that to occur. You're not alone. Yeah. You're not alone. I imagine not. So, yeah. I want to talk about the nutrition company. Should we keep going through these and just have it? This is, this is your show, Luke. So <laughs> Can you tell us? All right. Can you tell us about that? Tell us about your story with Parkinson's and then, and then what did you do when, you, when that was the diagnosis? I, I don't know if you talked about this in our other interview or not. No, probably not. I mean, at that time, I was still kind of off the heels of really dealing with that. So I probably would. Now I've had, I mean, this is nine years down the road. Um, so, and, and, and a lot of people, more people know about it. I'm a lot more transparent about it now that I feel like I got better control over it and I kind of see where it's going or really, quite frankly, in the blessing, not going, uh, which is a good thing. Um, yeah. So, man, when I, when I worked at Barnes Jewish Hospital uh, bef uh, uh, before moving to Costa Rica, um, and before, and kind of like during 119 was kind of beginning to take shape, I started having some issues with like a difficulty in swallowing. I'd be giving long presentations, which I do, and I've been doing right now, uh, but uh, I'm not having any issues, which is great. But my voice would start giving out. I'd start getting weakness of the voice, and I'd have a difficult time talking. Um, I, was, I was experiencing extreme fatigue. Like I'd even have to take naps on my lunch breaks and things like that just to actually make it through the day. I didn't really know what was going on. I, as most people my age at that time would have said, it was just stress or what have you, which makes a lot of sense. Stress does, can do all those things. But um, eventually, you know, we left Barnes Jewish Hospital. Uh, 118 became a full-time uh, operation for Steve and I. We moved to Costa Rica, but those things were not really going away. And then I started getting like a, a tremor in my left index finger. It would kind of come and go. And I was like, I, I remember even the day it happened that I just mentioned Leslie while we were driving uh, down the Pan American Highway. I was like, look at my finger. It just keeps doing this. I'm not sure what it's doing. And I didn't really realize what it was. And she kind of was aware of my other symptoms. And she kind of mentally, I mean, she told me later, but she mentally kind of put one and one together because she had, her grandfather had Parkinson's disease. So she's like, oh, this is not good. And then, so she didn't really say anything at the time, but then eventually it just stuck around. This was like December of 2013, that, uh, that my, my tremor, it just wouldn't go away. So uh, she's like, you need to see a neurologist. And so I did, and then, um, and this is still in Costa Rica, but you know, Costa Rica has a pretty good healthcare system. And actually the, the hospital I went to is actually trained out of Houston, Texas. And, um, and their joint commission hospital and all that. So I was like, well, you know, at least I can take confidence that they probably know what they're doing. And uh, so I, I, I went and, and, and scheduled an appointment with a neurologist and she did a lot of different tests. She, uh, uh, she just kind of did a balance test, which I didn't do too well on. Um, did a walking test and she found that my left arm was not swinging as much as my right. Uh, I, was take, I was shuffling a lot more. I wasn't taking as long as steps as I could and that's because your, your body's not as confident in its balance. So it's overcompensating by taking smaller steps, which I was like, makes sense because in Costa Rica, it's hard to find a sidewalk that isn't looked like a hit by an earthquake. So I was kind of tripping over a lot of things too and having sometimes a hard time going upstairs and I didn't really know what was going on. Um, got an MRI, ruled out ALS, got uh, labs, ruled out copper problems or B vitamin problems. And she's like, you know, it looks like it's Parkinson's disease, but you're 36 years old. This really shouldn't be happening. But my youngest patient is 18. It can't happen. Like Michael J. Fox would be a good example of that. Um, so it's like one out of 100,000 people that might get a diagnosis before uh, the age of 40. So, uh, so she's like, it looks like it's Parkinson's disease, but uh, what she'd like to do, because this is before DAT scans were really available and to kind of definitively prove it. Um, so she put me on uh, carbidopa, levodopa, which is kind of like the gold standard uh, drug treatment for Parkinson's disease. It doesn't solve the issue. It kind of just masks the problem. The disease continues to press, uh, continue because it's neurodegenerative, continues to get worse, but at least hides the problem. So if you respond to it, that almost definitively proves that you have Parkinson's. If you don't respond to it, you could still have Parkinson's, but it just means you're not responding to the drug. Well, uh, I had a trip to the U.S., uh, shortly after that particular uh, visit. Hmm. And uh, so she you know, got my prescription and uh, went to the U.S. And then about a week and a half to two weeks later, 
all of a sudden my tremor went away after taking the medication. So at that point, um, that was February of 2014, I knew I had Parkinson's disease. And that was, that was very difficult because at that point, knowing that my wife had exposure to her grandfather having Parkinson's disease and kind of seeing what it did to him, and just kind of, I'm learning all this time, like as I'm kind of talking to the doctor, I'm learning basically what does this mean for me? So it's kind of difficult to kind of know that basically your body just stops working the way it should. Uh, but cognitively, you're kind of all there, minus the focus and the fatigue. So um, at any rate, uh, <laughs> I, I get back to uh, Costa, Rica, uh, Costa Rica, go see the doctor again and say, hey, yeah, the drug worked. And uh, she's like, well, now I'm gonna take you off of it. I'm like, oh, great, this is probably the best I've felt in a long time, you're gonna take me off of this. She's like, you're too young to be on carbidopa levodopa. And the thing is, is when you're on carbidopa levodopa, um, the longer you're on it, sometimes that can increase chances of side effects. Like if you've ever seen Michael J. Fox, and you see him interviewing, when he's kind of moving like this, that's not Parkinson's disease. That's a negative, uh, that's uh, dyskinesia. That's, that's, the, that's an, a side effect of the drugs that he's on to kind of deal with the other issues that are even worse for Parkinson's disease. So eventually, the longer you're on carbidopa levodopa, it increases the chances of having those kinds of symptoms. So he's like, your symptoms are not really that bad. I'm like, they're not, and they're not, but it felt like they were at the time. But, so she took me off of that and she put me on like some, uh, called an MOAB inhibitor. That didn't do anything for me. It didn't help me at all. So all my symptoms came back. So, uh, and she's like, you can go on carbidopa levodopa, but you really should delay it as long as you can until it really starts impacting your quality of life. And knowing that the end game of Parkinson's is really a serious quality of life issue, I did really want to delay how quickly I went on carbidopa levodopa. So I took her advice and did not do anything. Well, and you know, being, the, being like a leader in, in ministry, you're like, man, my faith is so strong and it, it didn't impact me at all, but it did. And I was like, this is hard. So uh, we, we went through some really kind of bad times trying to figure out all of that and trying to figure out like, hey, what does this mean for us long term? But, can you, go ahead, yeah. Can you talk about the effect on your faith? Because, all right. Yeah. I think this will help a lot of people who come into the Torah and they think, now that I am keeping the law, I've solved all problems in my <laughs> life, I, I am spiritually aligned, and so nothing bad should happen to me because I should only be walking in blessings, et cetera, right? And yeah. so something then happens, bad, quote unquote, bad, and then it freaks them out. And they're like, well, what am I even doing? And yeah, there might be a little bit of that mentality. But the other question is like, sometimes you just like, it's the flip side of that. It's like, what did I do wrong, right? So like, so like why, why would this happen to, to me? Am I doing something wrong? And you start really exploring, like, really, like, am I not aware of something that I'm doing? Am I doing something that I shouldn't be doing? What can I do better? Those questions do enter your mind, and that, that does result in kind of a, a form of depression that, you know, Parkinson's kind of gives you that just as a gift of depression. <laughs> but, but you kind of cause it yourself a little bit, too, because that, that is, uh, so it is a little bit self-inflicted. And um, so I kind of went through that process of trying to say, hey, you know, am I doing something wrong? And uh, thankfully, my wife kind of slapped me out of that, and I kind of realized, hey, I need to take better control of this. There's things that perhaps I can do. Uh, to, to kind of work myself out of this slump, if you will. And, and keep in mind that, that this has happened over weeks, maybe a few months. It wasn't like this is going on for years. Thankfully, it does for a lot of people for Parkinson's. Some people, they never get out of it. They just kind of give up and sit on the couch, watch TV, and watch the disease waste them away. And I didn't want to kind of go that direction, especially with a family, especially with, you know, that's not part of my faith. That's not really, I think, is really what was intended for me. So. What, the, what kind of came out of that uh, is I realized that, hey, you know, maybe this isn't a curse. Because you read, you, read, you read Job. You read the guy the guy that was blind with you. She went up and said, hey, why, he was asked, why was this guy blind? Well, so that this can happen. I was like, well, maybe it's something like that. So uh, I went and just kind of read every single, like, you can get on like something like PubMed.gov and like read every uh, abstract, every journal article that's ever been produced by mankind which is nice, it's all accessible at your fingertips, which is fantastic. So I do keyword searches like Parkinson's plus this supplement, Parkinson's plus this supplement. And I would just start making a, a Excel spreadsheet of like, hey, these are all the supplements that could potentially help me. It helped fruit flies, it helped a mouse, some mice, humans, whatever, uh, a Petri dish, whatever it might've been. If it was somewhat beneficial for Parkinson's disease, I got that supplement and I started taking it. And, uh, and I was like, well, I could be destroying my liver and kidneys. So I got those tested every three months as well. But the thing is, is uh, I kind of started to realize what, where research has kind of gone wrong with Parkinson's disease over decades. And that is, is they're trying to find like one magic compound to solve all the problems. 
And I realized that there was really kind of four main problems for Parkinson's disease, and I don't really need to get into that. But the idea is, is if you take a whole collection of compounds that kind of individually targeting each one of those issues, you can make some significant progress. And I did. I started feeling better. I didn't solve everything, but I could say, hey, this is at least doing something. So it gave me hope and optimism that, hey, this is the right path. And then after some more research, I figured out, hey, I'm not really solving this problem too well. And I came across some additional research that solves the, uh, solved the mitochondrial deficiency issue, which is kind of like the number one problem. All the other problems are kind of secondary and you know, it cascades from that. And, uh, and once I, I, I actually discontinued all compounds and focused on one, and that made even the, the largest difference. So then I self-selected some of the other things that helped with those secondary issues that were kind of prioritized. And I kind of created just like a, this little, little formula that kind of attacked those four main problems of the mitochondrial dysfunction, the neurooxidation, the inflammation, and the protein aggregation. And those were the four main problems. And, um, and again, I didn't solve everything. My tremor did, has gone away. I can walk uh, well. Uh, one of the, the effects of Parkinson's is I did lose my, my uh, sense of smell. And that, that was weird because all the other things kind of improved gradually, but my sense of smell came back overnight. And I woke up one day, I could just smell everything. And uh, living in Costa Rica is kind of an ex interesting experience. Like, wow, this country does smell like flowers <laughs> in a lot of ways. Uh, but I didn't realize my sense of smell had deteriorated that much. Uh, the only reason I kind of knew a little bit was because, and this is going to be a little embarrassing, but with our first two children, when you're changing the diapers, I had an embarrassing gag reflex. <laughs> our, th our, th our third child, uh, Lydia, uh, was like, that wasn't much of an issue. Uh, and I was like, okay, she's born in Costa Rica. She's technically a Costa Rican. Maybe she's got, smells like roses or something, and that's not a big deal. But apparently, I just couldn't smell that bad. And it just, I didn't have that embarrassing gag reflex anymore. Um, that came back full steam ahead once I could smell everything <laughs> again. So a uh, blessing and a curse, I guess. But uh, so at any rate, uh, I solved most of my issues. Now, from time to time, I still have issues. And there's always going to be a, a permanent dopamine deficiency that I'm going to be dealing with because there's a limit to how much you can regress. Once cells have expired, they're no longer recoverable. But I was able to take cells that hadn't expired yet, they, but they just weren't healthy. And I was able to make them healthy again. and produce the dopamine that I need to kind of reduce the symptoms to some degree. But the key is, is when the cells are healthy, they're not dying. And I've been able to keep these cells healthy going forward. So I've, the most important thing for me with an early diagnosis is that I haven't been getting worse uh, from year to year. Uh, so, th and that's the biggest drawback with Parkinson's disease. It's not necessarily the symptoms, it's knowing that next year is going to be worse than the year prior. It's that you don't have any, with, with the exception of like praying for an absolute cure, which I don't think they're really close to that even though they say, they've been saying that for decades that they might be. Um, without an absolute cure, you always know that, hey, this is just going to keep getting worse and worse as things go on. And for nine years, I've been stable, and that's not supposed to be possible. So, uh, and that's, in a lot of ways, uh, really cool because what I thought was a curse became a blessing. Because So what I did is I was, on a, I was really active on a lot of Parkinson's forums, and a lot of us started self-experimenting in that way. And I kind of realized that what I was learning myself was translating really well to other people with Parkinson's disease. Depending on how long they've had Parkinson's, whatever, it wasn't 100% direct correlation. I had some advantages to me with the early diagnosis. Symptoms were not that bad, younger age, et cetera. Um, but at any rate, I could see that it was making an impact on other people. Um, and quite, and fr frankly, some of these compounds were a little expensive. And I was like, you know, what if I can get all these into one formula, I can reduce the cost by about half and then share it with other people. So that's exactly what I did. Uh, and I formed a company called We Have Parkinson's, and it's been around since uh, about mid-2015. And uh, it's been, uh, it's kind of grassroots, and it's hard. People with Parkinson's have been trained by their doctors to think that nothing can be done for them and, and, again, sit on the couch and take your medication. But for those who get past that and do try it, about 80% of people do well and do better. And uh, it either slows down, their, it seems to be slowing down uh, a lot of people's uh, progression, or in some cases, uh, pausing it entirely, like myself. And in some cases, it's actually can be even life saving. For instance, there's a, a our website's full of people that have their own video testimonies, and I'm thankful that people take the time to actually tell us what their experiences are because that's one of the few ways to help people understand like this could be helpful. But there's even a lady, that one of the things that can happen with Parkinson's, and I thankfully I didn't have this, but you can just be walking and all of a sudden your body just freeze. You have no control of movement at all, and you just fall over. Which, of course, if you have things like that are concrete or stone, you hit that, you're done. So sometimes people wear helmets or what have you. And this the lady, uh, she was falling seven, eight times a month. And she hurt herself more than a few times and just got back from the hospital. But she's been taking uh, that formula, and she had, had no falls ever since then. Uh, so things like that are just like, this is great. And sometimes I get to share 
uh, uh, my faith with them and, and too. So it kind of spills over into like other things that I do. And it's kind of cool to be able to do that as well. So. Whoa. So you 100, it 100% turned a, what would seem as a curse into a blessing for not just you, but like hundreds of people or however many people. Yeah. So to kind of get back to what you're asking is like, sometimes when you think things are a curse, you don't really know till later that it's a blessing. You might not know ever. You might not even know on this side of eternity whether or not what you're dealing with was a curse or a blessing. So that's, I think, kind of important to kind of realize. And one thing that I had to kind of relearn that because, and and there's a teaching that, that kind of goes over some of this stuff as well uh, called uh, When Life Crumbles on the 119 website. But uh, one of the first times I learned this lesson is we, my wife and I, we had a house fire when she was pregnant with Tyler. And this was in late 2006 and uh we we had i don't know if you want me to get into this or not but (laughs) so uh we we had just experienced one of those you're 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 maybe familiar with midwest winters where you can suddenly get a sheet of ice and uh, things like that happen we got one of those winter weather things and a sheet of ice happened and we're like we both worked at barnes juice hospital at the time in st louis and uh, like let's get to work early uh it might take us a while to get to work i don't want to deal with traffic in this you know so we did. We got up early that day, and I happened to notice, like, the house smelled funny. And uh, we just made something with sauerkraut the night before. I'm like, we're never having something with sauerkraut again because it just <laughs> sounds so ridiculous. So uh, we leave. Uh, we get, get to work. And uh, it wasn't maybe a, a few hours later that someone called us that our house was on fire. Or Leslie was trying to get hold of me, and I don't remember exactly who called her. I think it was our neighbor uh, called her um, and said our house was on fire. And uh, so we're like, oh my gosh. And uh, we get back and apparently uh, the ice caused a, an issue where the electricity was coming in, like a surge came into the house, but it didn't disconnect where it's supposed to disconnect the house. If a surge comes in, it stayed connected. It fried the, um, the electrical box while we were sleeping. And so that if we didn't get up early, and that was right outside of our bedroom, if we didn't get up early, that house would have burned down and... Um, with us actually in it oh my gosh. and uh and there because like when it when it went it just went it was started in the wall and it once it got out to our, our inside of the closet it just the whole house just went like that because it was an old house it was like 120 year old house uh but that wasn't really like the most amazing thing about that story it wasn't until later when they are doing the fire inspection that they realized because we had bought that house about a year earlier, and I was trying to do my best to to improve the house which I'm not very handy at all but I was trying and we had made some progress uh, but the house was initially flipped uh, before, and so the person that flipped it, either by accident or and hopefully not intentionally, but they took the gas furnace and they didn't vent it to the outside. They had a vent that went right into the wall and went nowhere. So the house uh, would have been accumulating carbon monoxide in our first winter, which had just started because of that storm. So if we would have stayed there any longer, we didn't have carbon monoxide detectors back then. Uh, so, and I, I know better now, but uh, we would just have not woken up one day. Oh so that, that fire, which we thought was a curse at the time, actually perhaps saved us, which oh is kind of cool. Oh my gosh, it's like so, twice. I know, right? So I had to relearn that lesson with Parkinson's. Hopefully I get the lesson now. I'm, I'm done, with, <laughs> done with hopefully anything like that happening again. But, wow. Uh, so uh, I, I like to tell those stories because, you know, it's, we live in a world where things get increasingly difficult and perhaps even more so. And I'm kind of confident that with those that's in the faith, that you know things are not going to get easier so that being said uh this kind of you know keeping in mind that there's a, a greater perspective that's beyond us and above us and uh kind of look at things that way yeah that's very helpful and hopeful i think now i think this might be a good bridge into your past work at the hospital because yeah. i wanted to get into you being a six sigma black belt and you working as a processes engineer. I wanted to eventually get into how that's influenced how you look at the Bible and how it's influenced your work at 119, but would you tell us a little bit about that job first and like what you do and maybe why you did that? <laughs> yeah, no, that's 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 a good question. Um, so yeah, I worked at, at Barnes Jewish Hospital. I, I started off there when I went to college and I started off there as an intern and since one of my degrees was in employee relations, um, I fit well into human resources. 
Um, and since I'm an introvert, that probably wasn't the best fit. But what they kind of found as I was initially hired on and kind of went from role to role and role, that I wasn't horrible at it, but I tended to enjoy getting involved with projects. In fact, every new role that I was involved, I kind of got frustrated with the different processes and I would just kind of reinvent my own. And uh, so they kind of noticed that. And then uh, a, it was in the days where a lot of companies were taking the Lean and Six Sigma methodologies from um, GE or Toyota and trying to implement them in different industries. And healthcare was kind of a new field for that kind of uh, way of thinking. And what Six Sigma really means, um, it, it's a way to manage or mitigate the amount of defects in a particular process. So the idea is like if you're flying an airplane, you don't really want a 1% chance of some critical components failing because you might fall out of the sky, right? So the idea is like when you build an airplane that you want like a very, very low chance of that flight not being able to make it to your destination. Um, so Six Sigma, the idea is that a process should have an error rate of like 0.00034%, which is very much near zero, right? Um, now, most processes don't make it there, but that's the end goal. That's the stretch goal. Um, so there's different ways of process improvement methodologies that different companies like Toyota, GE was probably one of the first ones that did this. Um, different types of uh, improvement um, means to actually kind of get to that particular objective. Um, and then there was also a focus on lean management, which is just the idea that every uh, process has probably about 80%. 80% of our, any process is usually about waste. It means it's just not value added. It doesn't add any value to your, your client or your customer uh, at the end of the day. So the idea is to identify that waste and extract that from the process so you're only left with value added work. Um, so those two process improvement methodologies kind of became part of my job. Um, and it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that. I kind of missed that in a lot of ways. Um, and the longer I distance from that, uh, the more I kind of, man, I don't even know. So you start forgetting kind of what your previous expertise and your previous life was. Um, but I do retain a lot of those characteristics, and some of those for me are just kind of native. There's a lot of things I'm not good at, but one of those things I, I, I was pretty good at. In fact, I was so good at it then that a lot of times I had extra time to kind of focus on things like Bible study and what have you. And, and that's actually kind of how I approach the scriptures. I, I like to look at the scriptures um, from a very, like a pattern perspective and, uh, and a keyword perspective and kind of seeing like what is the big picture and how does this all fit together. And, uh, and, and sometimes it serves really well. Um, some, it, it can annoy certain people because some people don't look at the scriptures that way. So they don't really see where you're coming from. And, uh, and we have some people on, our, on the 118 team intentionally don't look at scriptures that way. That way we're not really kind of looking at teachings that really focus on the higher level and the bigger perspective or in unique insights. And we might get more academic or scholarly in some way. So we try to diversify our approaches on the scriptures in that way because I tend to be more biased to one kind of way of thinking or approach. But um, so that, that's my background, uh, I guess, uh, in, in that particular world. I, uh, I guess it... it in a lot of ways, and a lot of people can probably say this, but there was a lot about that that kind of prepared me for what I do today, even with 119 Ministries. And um, one of my interests were always end times, and that's actually how 119 got started. Uh, I, I would look at some of these patterns and end times and what have you, and I realized that when I was looking at things from a dispensationalist perspective, this is pre-Torah, um, I was like, something's not right here, something's not working. And that's how I got connected to Steve because he was very focused on end times and it was a, kind of a happy marriage in that way and uh, and still is and because uh, we still chat about those kinds of things all the time but he kind of talked some sense into me that was you know anti-dispensationalism and I kind of started seeing that and I got so frustrated with the fact that like how did I miss all of this that is like I I, I, I probably prayed one of the most powerful prayers that I ever had is which I just want to understand end times. I just want to get it. Please show me. And, uh, and I can't say I'm there yet, but what I did kind of realize is that he needed to show me the Torah really before you can really understand end times or biblical eschatology to really any reasonable degree. And once you kind of understand that the whole Bible is true and applicable and, and how, how God's law is involved with all of that, you start understanding like the biblical feasts that are related, their prophetic foreshadowings and, and all kinds of different things, uh, obviously. That just opens up doors to the new way of thinking that a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of mainstream Christianity doesn't really have the opportunity to consider because they're kind of restricted in that way, like, just like I was. Um, so, and that's not a criticism, that's just, that's just kind of the way it is. And I do pray that a lot of people kind of get past that and kind of say, hey, there's, a, there's 
this isn't, it just makes the Bible so much smaller in a good way, right? And uh, so that actually, that's what birthed uh, 119 Ministries is because I started kind of shaking dispensationalism from my, uh, from the way I kind of saw the Bible. And I wrote a paper on an end times forum that called the era of dispensationalism, which is a form of that actually is a teaching still at 119 Ministries and became one of our first teachings. And uh, all of a sudden these Jewish people started liking the, the post and I called them Jewish because they're keeping the Torah. And I didn't even know really though what that was at the time. Like, why are these Jewish people liking my post? And I kind of realized that once you dissolve dispensationalism, dispensationalistic thinking, and there's no separation between the church and Israel, and they're kind of one and the same, you kind of realize, well, what does that mean for the Torah or God's law? And you start to realize that's for us too. That's why all these people are loving this particular paper. And uh, so that, that was at the moment, it's like, what did I just do? And that set off a whole cascade of a few months of just pouring through that and uh, trying to understand what the big picture there was, right? Which is a, a bigger picture than I could have ever imagined. And then I brought Steve into it. It's like, hey, listen, look at this stuff. And he's like, oh my gosh. You know, and then all of a sudden our family and friends were like, you guys are nuts. And I thought to be excited, right? When you get in, a lot of people know this too. When you get into the tour, you're like, what I call sponge mode. You're just like, oh, this is awesome. This is exciting. You just can't stop soaking it all in, right? You expect everyone to kind of be the same, but you got to remember everyone's kind of gets there in their own way. And it's not always the same. A lot of times it is, but it's not always the same. You can't force that to occur. So when you try to, when you try to make that happen, it doesn't. But one thing that did come out of that, I started getting a lot of questions from friends and friends and family. And so did Steve. And we just like, and true to Steve's style too, like when you get a question, we're going to answer it, right? We're going to answer this once. And uh, so we did that and uh, we'd post these things online and we was like, hey, other people are liking these as well. Maybe we can help people out with this. And what became scripts became video teachings because that was Steve's expertise. And uh, then 119 was formed. So I guess that's the transition from being a process improvement engineer at a world-class healthcare system to how do you fall into ministry? It's just accidental wow. in a wow. lot of ways. So I'm, I think a lot of people are glad that you did. Um, well, it, it, it's, and that's kind of weird too, because like when you look at it, you're just like, I'm just doing what I love to do. Right. And, uh, and, uh, we have a really awesome team at 119 now. And, and, uh, I realize this interview is with me, but really at 119 is a team. Uh, we can't, we, we couldn't do what we do if we didn't, if we didn't structure ourselves and our processes and work the way that they were. And, and I'm, I'm glad because, uh, it, it is, it's a little overwhelming at time when, when I attend Sukkot, which I get to attend Sukkot's now that are actually organized and a lot of people. And that's something we didn't have you know, as far as fellowship goes. And, and now we do, but it's the, the hard part for me is like when people come to you, it's like, Oh, you know, when I has done this or that, that, and I'm like, Okay, and I don't know how to respond. It's a little awkward, but uh, <laughs> it, it's good to hear. It's good to hear. But I'd like to remind people, like, hey, we have an awesome team. Uh, we have, and it's even even since we moved back to the states, like we brought on David, uh, we brought on Mark, and they are just their minds are just brilliant. I like I like the way they think, and and that, what I really like about it is they think in a different way than I do. So sometimes we're like this, but that's always a good thing because we we, we it, they see things from a different perspective, and, and I see things from a different perspective. And uh, and I and I'm, I know I understand why they're they're on the team and uh, and uh, it's just it's just great to see that uh, our kind of hacker when Steve and I kind of started it back in the day and seeing where it is now it's just fantastic and Steve's doing some great things with Torah family like uh, selfishly I'm I'm just glad that he did what he did because I'm getting all the benefits and so is my family uh, which is with him operating. So. That's great. And now you guys are part of the same like group, I guess. Yeah, I yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. IRL. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I want to. I want to make sure we get to some of these. Oh goodness. All right. What's something you think Torah observant believers are wasting time and energy on that you, as a process improvement engineer, would cut if you want to help the body better follow Yah? What would you cut out? It's always difficult to say someone should or shouldn't do this, right? It's everyone's responsible for their own faith. I could say some of the things I don't really understand and may, might be a better way to answer it. But the advent of the internet, you know, I'm getting older, but the advent of the internet has been an amazing thing for the world and everyone knows that. But in, in, in the faith, and even in faith, the world of the faith, you know, our faith is, we have the access to information or perspectives and studies almost limitless. 
um, the way to connect with others. That's fantastic because we need to be able to connect with others. But it also depersonalizes uh, the, the way that we connect with others in a lot of ways, too. And people have people mm-hmm. have a lot more freedom and autonomy to kind of say things and do things that they probably shouldn't. And I think that's one of the more damaging aspects uh, of of all of that. And I think a lot of times we we forget that and if we are approaching the time of the end, and, and I have a bias that I think we are, that one of the, there's really one thing that end times is focused on, and that's repentance. And repentance means just circling back to the Torah, right? And the Torah is just founded on loving God and loving others. So what I'm not seeing is a lot of love in, in a lot of the dialogue and a lot of engagement we see online. There is certainly a lot of that, right? But there's, and I, I don't think what I'm saying would surprise a lot of people that have any exposure to what I'm talking about. I think there's just a lot of opportunity that, like, hey, if we're truly preparing for end times, which is focused on repentance, we should see a lot more of loving God and loving others. And I'm not seeing a lot of that. So it makes me a little nervous about how ready we are as a faith-based community in preparation for the return of our Messiah. And that's a little scary. I think that's important. Do you, do you think that this, that this movement is growing? I know that's just a totally different question, but I'm curious from your perspective. Yes. Um, there's obviously people that have been, like we want to call it a movement, there's people that have been involved with it longer than I have. Like, quite honestly, what I did, I don't really recommend anyone doing, which is getting to the tour and immediately start saying, hey, I can start teaching other people. Um, but from that time that was then until the time that is now, and even looking back on what we understand the movement was before uh, my involvement was and one of teens involvement was, it certainly is growing. Um, but it's, it's also a little difficult to know to what extent, because one thing that we don't really have a lot of yet is, which mainstream Christianity still has kind of this advantage, which is the direct one-on-one kind of fellowships and personal connections. That a lot of us are so scattered because we're not grown to the point where there's a, a lot of us, with the except, exception of certain geographical pockets like I'm certainly taking advantage of right now. Um, there's just not a lot of, there's just not a lot of that I think I'm seeing going on, going on I guess. People aren't grouping up and like, as much as they'd like, I'd, I'm sure. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah it'd, be, it'd be great to see a lot more of that, but um, what we, we are seeing more and more of that. Um, I do believe that it is certainly still growing. We certainly see that uh, 119 Ministries teachings each and every year, more and more people are watching those teachings, not just because we have more of them, but we're seeing that that is happening. And I think other Torah-based ministries are seeing the same thing. And quite honestly, there's more Torah-based ministries. So uh, that being said, even that's evidence that there is there is growth there. But it is, since we're not very centralized and we're fragmented, that's not necessarily, I'm not saying that as a, necessarily a huge criticism, though it's not necessarily a great thing, but there is also reality that we have don't have a high degree of transparency as to how much growth is actually occurring. Uh, so, because there's there's not really any great way to know. All I can say is from my limited vantage point, which I guess 119 Ministries is probably one of the larger Torah-based ministries out there, but from our vantage point, it is certainly growing, but how do you quantify that? Uh, and that I don't really have a great answer for that. That's not, I think that's a good answer right there. <laughs> can you walk us through the process your video content goes through from in, inception to release? And oh, is that process all... Process question. <laughs> yeah, no, back to the process question. Is that... Re- is the process that you guys have come up with, partially at least, informed by your past experience doing process engineering? I believe so. Um, again, the idea is to minimize waste, focus on the value add that we can give those who benefit from our teachings, and minimize the amount of error that's present in our teachings, right? So there's a few ways that we, we tackle that. One is we all work remotely. So uh, sometimes that can be make a process very difficult, but in our, in our circumstances, it makes things very easy because we have a very controlled structure as to how a, a, a teaching is birthed all the way to its, or the idea is birthed all the way to its actual publication. And that works really well for a remote-based team. Like we have team members that live in Texas. Uh, we have people that live in Missouri. I live in Arkansas. And it, it we're kind of scattered. We have 
those that are in Costa Rica still. So there, we can still do all these things even though we're not in close proximity, which means that we can work more efficiently in that particular way. Now, teachings can manifest in a couple different ways. One is it could just be uh, a teacher has an epiphany or, or, or is led down a path like, hey, I, need, I really want to get this kind of teaching done, and this is why. And they'll present it to the team and we'll say, yeah, it's like a great idea, let's go for it. Or we have a list of different teachings that we know that the community kind of needs. And, uh, and, and maybe it's uh, an apologetic space teaching or maybe it's more of a message or whatever it might be. We have a list of that. So uh, a teacher has the autonomy to, uh, whether it be David, Mark, Jared, myself, whoever, um, to kind of pick and choose which teachings they want to focus on. Because one thing is, is that you know when you're writing, and especially when it's matters of the faith, you don't always get to choose when you're inspired or when things are just kind of coming to you. So that's one way that we can fuel a production is by not forcing certain teachings to come out when they'll come out when they're supposed to come out. Um, but when a, a, what, how it works is uh, a teacher will, will craft a, a transcript after it's kind of approved. And what we do is we send it through an approval process. So every member of the team is exposed to the teaching before it actually gets to the moment of recording. So when, uh, for instance, like Mark, he'll, he'll produce a script, uh, he'll CC me, and then, but he'll send it to David for a review. And those two brains work together and do some amazing things. And then once it's kind of through them, then it's usually 99.9% .9 already. But then it kind of goes to me and I'll give maybe a little bit of input here or there and say, hey, maybe add this or add that or maybe phrase this a little bit differently. And then once it's done with me, then it goes to Jared. And Jared, uh, he's fantastic because he really covers a deficiency that I have, which, again, I'm more high level and I'm embarrassingly deficient in attention to detail. Um, except for when that detail serves me to form a conclusion, but then it's just gone, right? But even just a general observance, it's just not there. Um, he can take a teaching and he just goes through it and he can just see like, hey, this, you know, he, he, he's got good exposure to uh, the world of Facebook and YouTube and all the different things that people are talking about because he's our, our internet marketing guy. Um, but he also can anticipate like how someone might react to this sentence or that sentence. And uh, so he goes through and says, hey, tweak this, tweak that, or even just, hey, this word might be better than that word. Just things that like would drive me nuts. Like I, I can't do that, but he's superhuman on that kind of stuff. And he's kind of like the last uh, eyeballs on a particular script. And then it goes into a folder. These are all just folders that, that the script's just kind of jumping through online. And then it goes to a folder where it's just ready to record. We record the teaching and, um, and uh, uh, once that happens, then of course things are a little more hard coded. It's a little harder to fix a, an error once it kind of gets the, once it's been recorded. Um, though things are changing with AI, they can tell I take my voice. Uh, our video editor is just doing some amazing, almost scary things. So you, you can take my voice, and if I say something wrong when I go to St. Louis to record, and uh, usually I would have to wait till the next time I'm in town to say, okay, I'll fix it now, which means that the teaching got delayed a few months, perhaps with it with a trip. Now you can just use AI and have AI say it for me, and no one knows the difference. It's just crazy stuff. But at, at any rate, that kind of goes back to the process improvement uh, idea. Is that it's easier to fix a problem earlier in the line before it gets down to the end of the road. Um, it's a lot less costly. It's a lot less time consuming. It's a lot less frustrating to fix a problem when it's just digital text uh, versus when we've got it on, on, on to recording and you're doing what you're doing. You know exactly what I'm talking about, right? So, uh, so that's why we spend so much time on the front end, making sure that the script is as close as to as perfect, as, at least our eyes are perfect as it can be. And then we record it, and then it goes through the team again. The whole team watches a, a teaching and makes sure, hey, uh, because of editing errors can happen, right? And that's just, these are still done by humans, not AI yet. But these things are, you know, difficult to always catch. So it goes through the eyeballs of the whole team. And uh, we say, hey, fix this, fix that. And we have a little short list a lot of times. And sometimes the teaching gets through and there's no problems at all. But uh, usually there's some room for improvement. And there's, there should be. And, um, and then once that's done, then it gets uh, published on our website first. And that goes in, in, our, in our email um, list. And that means the community who have first access to that then are the, are the next eyeballs before it goes on YouTube. Once it's on YouTube, it's more permanent because YouTube does not allow you to take down a teaching and and, and, and put up a new one without losing all the views, the momentum, um, the audience engagement, uh, the um, discussions, et cetera. So we try to go through all those steps before it gets on YouTube because YouTube's the final copy of any teaching. 
and I say final loosely because we still have uh, what we call remasters, which means every three to five years, we go back and look at each script and say, hey, do we still agree with this? Is there anything that we would improve, change? Is there anything that the, the community is saying, hey, you didn't cover this or that? So we have a, a collection of notes that we'll go through to when we're remastering to make sure that we can improve teachings further. And that's some teachings will go through that process sooner than later, depending on how popular they were or how much how needed they were. Like the Pauline Paradox series, for example, has been through that process twice. That's a pretty popular series. Um, and so that was a very important thing for us to make sure that, hey, how can we keep making this better? And again, it's always about continuous improvement. That's a deep one. The Pauline Paradox is yeah. a super deep one. Yeah, it is. And, but it's needed. You know, Paul is uh, a little hard to understand sometimes. So. And now they have that book about it, too, which is really great. Yeah, David did a great job of taking what was the video teaching and uh, rewording, wordsmithing it in such a way that um, it, it presents itself well as a, as a, as a, as a book, which... Uh, we do have on Amazon, we have, it's in Kindle, and they, uh, Amazon allowed us to make it only 99 cents for Kindle, that's as low as they would allow us to go on that one, and we got it to, like, I think, 4 or $5 as the book, which is pretty much the cost of it. So that's the idea is to get it out there as much as possible. And, and, and speaking of getting things out there as much as possible, I guess as far as new things at 119, and I probably won't if it's shamelessly plug something here, but this is, as I kind of mentioned, you know, it's questionable about what kind of times we're entering in and, and what kind of pressures those in this faith might have as far as what we're allowed to say and what we're not allowed to say, uh, especially internet, you know, being canceled or censored, so to speak. And it's a shame that we have to say things like that, but we we have now uh, with, you know, uh, because of technology, we can actually get all like five, 600, 700 teachings of 119 onto like a little thumb drive. And so now we have that available and you can just plug it right into your phone and you can watch any 119 video uh, without needing internet. Uh, and, and which is fantastic, and then it's all at your fingertips, and then we put every transcript that we've ever made on there as well for those who like to read, and also every worksheet or what have you. So that is, that's available now that can be found on our website, but I only mention that just because it might be a good idea to have, if there, if there are certain resources and stuff that you want to have available that you don't want to only have available by streaming, um, now might be a good time uh, over the next, now to next few years to, uh, to have those available to you, so. Yeah, have it on. Offline. Offline, on demand. Yeah, 100%. That's very cool. Wow. Man. Now, for a while, when you first started and did scripts, would you put it out to the world first before you recorded a video? And then you'd be like, give us comment. Give it. Yeah, well, and that's, that's, again, that's, that, that happened before 118 existed. We would just start putting things on Facebook when people use more Facebook more. But uh, we would put things on Facebook as just kind of like what they used to call notes, right? They don't even think they have that anymore. But... Um, we would, Steve and I would just put things as a note on Facebook and yeah, people would say, Hey, yeah, this is very helpful. And then we'd actually say, you know, when people start, it, it, what's really helpful is that, that people don't agree with it, right? The people that don't agree that kind of expose your weaknesses in, in any kind of thing that you're publishing. So, uh, it was really great when people started attacking it. I loved it when people would attack it because I would say, Hey, does their argument have any merit? How can I make this better? The people that agree with it is not always, it's nice to hear that, but it's not always helpful for improving it. But the people that like that no people that normally would make you angry and a little upset like you know because of what they're saying but actually they're the most helpful people in a lot of ways as long as they're saying things that you know just criticizing for the sake of criticizing but actually saying hey this doesn't make sense for this particular reason and so you look at that and say hey now i'll address that the next one so that's great i guess at the volume that you guys are doing it now it would just makes no sense to put out a script beforehand and get wait for comment and then hope that it's constructive because you you've put in this process it seems yeah, like yeah it's, it's it's what's what's yeah it's it's really difficult to actually kind of do that because yeah it, the amount it would take us so much when you have thousand ten thousand people reading a script i can't imagine the amount of comments you would get right so it's it's it'd be difficult to manage that it would actually be more hindering to the process than not um yeah so, uh, but since we, that's why we kind of built on the back end that remastering process if, if needed. And then things do still go through like a community review, at least from the video perspective. But um, since most of our, our teachers are pretty knowledgeable and pretty in tune with all the different arguments out there, all the different positions, um, it does prepare us reasonably well to get a teaching at least 99% you got four there. guys now. I mean, it's not just yeah. you. Or yeah, you or yeah, which is great. Like, yeah, it's fantastic. So uh, uh, that does allow us not only to be a little diversified in our approach, um, but, you know, we can get more done. Um, and 
quite honestly, it was a little bit easier on the front end of the ministry to do all these teachings because it was very, we knew exactly what needed to be done and and the, some of the teachings were a little easier, but now we kind of dive deep into a lot of different subjects, a lot of complicated things. And sometimes the script will take weeks, months to produce. So when you have a larger team, even though we're kind of producing the same amount of content, it takes a lot of time to produce things. I, the last time I measured it, uh, with, for every one minute of video, it's about eight to 12 hours of work for the whole team. So it, it can, it, it, it's a lot more work than people realize. And that's, that's including all the writing, that's including the back and forth, that's including research, and, but also the video editing and all of that stuff too. But it, you know, that's, it's a lot of time for, for a 10 minute video can take 130 hours of, of the team to, 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 to get through sometimes. So it's wild. some more or less, depends. yeah, it's crazy. People that aren't making this stuff. I have to thank Mark and Jared too because they read that book that I wrote and then yeah. they gave me a lot of feedback where it was like, oh, I think they're right about this. And I got to like, so it took longer for me to research after that, but it was really helpful. So, yeah, so you had some exposure to kind of like how yeah. you, what you went through is kind of the same thing that we went through. And sometimes as a teacher, you're just like, oh, because, you know, it's, it's sometimes when he gets to Jared and I kind of poke fun at him sometimes, like, I know I'm getting a lot of comments back. <laughs> so, what is uh, and, I, and I'm not going to agree with all of them, and he knows that, and, but a lot of them I will agree with. And uh, so that's kind of the thing is, like, it, it just invites discussion uh, uh, from a team team level since we're not, we're not all working individually. We're all working together. And uh, a lot of ways that can slow things down and make things very difficult and sometimes even frustrating. Like, we're all human. Like, it doesn't always feel good when someone says, well, not sure this makes a lot of sense. I have teachings that I've written for years ago that will probably never be published just because it doesn't get through all the approval channels at 119, and that's okay. Um, maybe someday they, they will, but that's just the way it goes. I'd rather have teaching to get stopped, you know, uh, than to release a teaching that maybe doesn't make as much sense as it should because, you know, 119's only got one reputation, and that goes south, it's hard to recover from that. And the whole idea is it all give glory to God. So I don't want to be in a position where, like, we're just doing things for the sake of doing things. There is the objective that we only exist for one purpose, and I want 119 to kind of be part of that going forward, if at all possible. So It seems like the reputation is pretty good. I mean, just from an outside perspective. Well, it's good to I've hear. Because <laughs> I've seen people who disagree with you, like Mike Winger, and they disagree just, he disagrees just in general with some 119 things. But when he made videos about stuff, you guys had a little back and forth there. And he was, he, he seemed to have respect for your process, the way you guys go forward, and it must be reflective of what you've just described now. Like, Yeah, that's good to hear. I mean, I, I, and I do remember, yeah, Mike Ringer, I, I, we did have a video. We don't usually focus like on making a video that's kind of like a response to another person. That's something we actually really do try to avoid, but in that case we did just because he seemed very open and engaging and very respectful, which is uh, not always something you've, that's very common. So uh, since we value that highly, we, we want to take advantage of the fact that someone else seems to value that highly. So we open those, those lines of communications in that way. And it's good to hear that he interpreted it in the same way that we were interpreting his approach as well. So even yeah, though, even though at the end of the day, we don't necessarily have high agreement on a lot of things. Um, uh, I think, you know, seeds are planted and other people take advantage of the conversation that happened. They'll see different perspectives and what makes sense. As they're studying out, they're like, hey, what makes sense? You know, who's, who's making the best points here? Yeah. Yes. All right. Let me make sure I get to all these. Okay. What advice would you give? Oh, wait. What's one? Oh, this one's interesting. <laughs> what's one important belief that you used to hold and you don't anymore? And how has that changed your life? This doesn't have to be about the Bible, but it could. Okay, that's a good question. Obviously, Torah is is part of that. I mean, that was <laughs> that's about as li faith wise. That's about as life changing as it got, uh, with the exception of just entering the faith at all, right? So, uh, but that was certainly a big change, and I don't think I'm going to surprise anyone with that response. Uh, that's true. One of the things that was kind of interesting, and, and not everyone's going to agree with this, and that's and that's fine, is. Uh, you know, I did a series called the Life After Death series, and some people had some questions like, you know, what after we die, what happened? Do we go to a heaven? Is there is there an actual hell? What does that look like? And my perspective has changed on that quite a bit from when I was previously a Baptist, and so I can't say that really changed or my behavior or changed how I operate in the world or anything like that. But uh, it was kind of a more profound change because it's a little controversial, and that was probably one of the bigger ones. But um, 
I, I can't think of anything specifically. Uh, but the Torah is like the main the thing. The Torah would be an obvious answer, yes, 100%. I mean, that was in a, in a fantastic and an amazing way. I can't even imagine, like, not a ding on mainstream Christianity at all, but when you're mainstream Christianity, you don't see, you, you can see from well, how that's going to go from the day you're there to the day you die. All the questions are answered already. It, it just seems that way. Uh, it just seems like that you you know like, what are you supposed to believe? Well, what, they tell you what you're supposed to believe, right? Mm -hmm. But we, when we're, we enter the Torah, we're, a lot of times we're trying to f understand why we believe what we believe, and and not only that, be able to defend it, right? In the midst of some serious opposition at times, it forces you to have to have an answer for things if you really want to be vocal and transparent about what you do believe because people are going to question it. People are going to like, why are you different than everybody else? And you have to have an answer for that because as soon as you start talking, well, I do this and that, well, but what about this? So that's kind of, I think, one of the main differences is uh, our unique perspective, which I, I'm, it shouldn't be a unique perspective in my opinion, but it, it, it because it is somewhat of a unique perspective, it forces us to dive deeper. It forces us to have answers. Um, at least for those who want to have an answer for those who ask them questions. Uh, whereas, but when you're, like, let's say, for an example, a Baptist, all I have to say is, I'm a Baptist. They're like, okay, I don't have any questions for you because I know exactly what you believe and, and what have you, for the most part. I know that I'm speaking in generalities, and, you know, people can have different beliefs about certain things or that, but it's just more profound when, you're, when, you've been, when you enter the world of being tour pursuant. Well, and also, it's a still the Wild West, it seems like, because there are people, people who will call themselves Torah observant, pursuant, or Hebrew roots, or whatever, and there's a, it's a grab bag. And it's that's the downside <laughs> of kind of like the opposite of that. Because, like I mentioned before, there's not re, it's not very centralized, and what have you, and because people do test everything, there could be a downside to that, that people kind of get off on the fringe aspects of things and focus a little, and then you asked the question earlier, it's like, what's one thing that you wish that people wouldn't do? It's like, sometimes I wish there wasn't as much a focus on some of the fringe things. I think it's a, a lot of times it's a distractor. And I don't think people would necessarily disagree with that. I think but people would be surprised about how much of a distraction it really is in their life when they actually kind of step back and say, wait, why did I just spend 10 hours this week on this, right? Really, how much, how important really is this? Is especially if the times we're living in are preparing for the return of Messiah, what would he want us to be focused on? If he's focused on, like I said before, repentance and, and all that, and if that's what the main focus of end times is, is coming back to to the word, and that's rooted in, in love of God and love of others, are, are we evidencing that in our lives? Like, hmm. what what does that really look like? And that, and that I think, is if that could be one thing that could get out of, of our conversation or at least present in our conversation is I think we just need to do better at loving God and loving others. And I get, I fully get that. Uh, some of the things we debate and some of the French things we're talking about is like, how do we apply the Torah, right? Or what does that mean to apply the Torah? And I get that's what we're talking about in a lot of instances. But there's also a, a, a great reality of like, you know, when even time we're, always ask ourselves when we're debating some of those things, it's not, and it's not always a bad thing to do that uh, to, at all. But we should always be asking ourselves the questions like, if I if I understand this better, how much better would I be loving God, and how much better would I be loving others by understanding this better? Mm -hmm. and, and 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 even the path and even the the process of doing that, am I loving others by through this process? And am I, when I'm talking to others about it and what have you, how do I am I coming across as patient? Am I coming across as kind? Um, and if you're doing those great things, then that's fantastic. Then then we're doing well. Um, but if we're not doing those things, then I think we missed the whole point entirely. You make me think that we should encourage people to do a time audit of their week for this purpose, to see, are they spending an inordin inordinate amount of time, or at least how much time? Now you're on... sounding like a process improvement engineer. It must be contagious. <laughs> well, I'm reading a book called The Effective Executive, and they, yeah, they tell you, you, you yeah. you got to look at all the minutes you're spending in the week, and where are they going? And, I mean, if you put that towards your question of, is this loving God and loving others, then, well, maybe you can eliminate some of the, the time that you're yeah. spending this Because if, if, if time is a resource, there's only one way to increase the amount of time you have, because you can't do it chronologically. You only have to do it by what you're doing or not doing. And that's, that's a good way to look at it, 100%. That's cool. How, all right, when did you feel like God was green lighting 119? 
Or did we already get into that a little? I think it might have been. Like, it might have been implied. Uh, quite honestly, <laughs> I, I, it, it just, I, mentioned, I used the word accidental in a lot of ways. And 118 Ministries did kind of just accidentally happen. We saw a need. People were responding to the need. And when you're in the faith and you ha- see people having a need, you want, and you know that you might be able to help with that, how horrible would it be if you don't, right? And that was kind of more the way that that all transpired. Is, is, it, it, I, I believe if Yahweh sees you fulfilling a need, He's going to bring more things that you might be capable of of, of helping others in certain ways. And uh, and as long as you respond to it, and I and I don't know, I can't say that I 100% always have eyes to see and ears to hear when He's trying to tell me like you should be doing this or that. But I do try. Uh, and like I said before, like and this is true. With, my marriage with Leslie as well is like our whole time in the faith. It seems like everything we are exposed to is a few years later that has some kind of relevancy of what we're supposed to do later. And, uh, and it, cause it's not always immediate. Like for example, I mentioned my previous job of presenting and, and, uh, and ways of looking at, at things, uh, from an engineering perspective, that was very useful in a lot of ways. Uh, when I was in college and my first exposure to Costa Rica, uh, happened. That was the eventual answer of like, how do we make 119 Ministries even exist, right? Because uh, we had to quit our full-time jobs and we had no way to make that financially sustainable. So if I hadn't gone to Costa Rica when I was in college, I don't know if 119 would have existed because we wouldn't have really, or it would have just been a lot slower of a start. And it maybe it wouldn't have served as well as it maybe does today if it serves well at all. So like when you... You, when you look at all these different things uh, historically, you start to realize that these dots kind of connect and that you are kind of on the right. It's like validating that, hey, I'm kind of on the right path, I think, because I could have ignored all of that. I could have, any time that a need showed up, I could have said, you know what, it, it's too difficult or it's too hard or I don't have time for that. Or, you know, we kind of talked about earlier, like when I created the, the farming business for my children, right? I didn't want to go talk to chefs. That was actually the scariest thing in, in the world for me. But there was a need for that to get done, right? And so sometimes you just have to do hard things. And, uh, I, and I guess if there's one certain lesson that's an overarching theme in the scriptures even is like when, when God tends to do things through his people, but very rarely is it ever easy. <laughs> it's, in fact, I would say that the common denominator there is almost always hard. So as long as you're doing hard things, you're, you might be on the right path. So, Wow, that's true. You make me think of Abraham there, <laughs> leaving his well, life. Well, don't, I don't want <laughs> to be that kind of comparison, but yes. Did, did I already ask what advice would you give to a believer who just started keeping the Torah? You did not, but <laughs> my advice probably for that, and we've mentioned this even in teachings, but don't do what I did. <laughs> and I would talk about this a little bit already is, when you, when you come into the tour, you are pretty excited, usually. You're like, man, man, things are making so much sense. And when things make sense, that's exciting, right? Because all of a sudden you're seeing things from a vantage point that, like, I get it. This is, this is transformational. This makes a lot of sense. But in that zeal and excitement, it does not always mean that it's the right time to talk to every single person that you know or don't know about it. Um, there, there is an advantage to learning how to present things with patience and kindness and how, like and asking yourself like if someone responds negatively what you're presenting when you're so excited about something when someone responds quite honestly a little maybe a little poorly maybe not with the patience or kindness that you would hope that they would or and they're not inviting more conversation then it's not the right time to be talking to other people so the the idea is there is slow down uh, as fast as things seem to be going is sometimes it's best to kind of slow down and understand everything has the right timing. It might mean that you should be talking to somebody 24 hours after getting the Torah, right? There's certain people you have to talk to, your wife, children, so maybe, maybe some key friends, key family. But there's also, a, a, don't just wing it. I winged it a little bit. And uh, if I would have maybe done a better job there, uh, it, you know, I, I, I have the blessing that a lot of my family has uh, does fall in the tour, but it took him some time because I didn't do the right thing on the front end. So uh, there, there is an opportunity to kind of sit down and think about those things before you kind of move forward with it, if that makes some sense. Absolutely. 
Is there any advice they should ignore that people might give them from within this? <laughs> and if not, we'll just skip over that one. But Well, some people, the advice that they might give would be like, look at this, look at that. I would say start to prioritize what you look at. And again, it goes back to like, if I'm looking at this, ask the question is why? I love the question why. Why is one of the best questions we can ask about anything. In fact, in the Six Sigma world, uh, they would say that there's a, a process improvement methodology called the five whys. And all you do is you ask the question why, and whatever response you get, or even with yourself or with someone else, you ask the question why again. You do it five times. You start getting to the root of something. And I think we should probably be asking the question why more often because anytime we're asking questions, we understand something better. Even with ourselves, with the scriptures, and, and asking why in the scriptures is one of the best things you could do to, to really build your understanding of knowing God better. Because if, if we know God through the word, asking yourself why on any kind of word, sentence, paragraph, whatever it might be, the worst thing that can happen is you know God better. There's no, there's no reason that could be ever construed as a, a bad thing. That's why you guys test everything. That's right. It's a way of saying why. I love that Paul said that. So we, oh, two more. What's Shabbat like in the Sherman house? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's very different than it used to be. Uh, in Costa Rica, we would have, uh, it was fun. We would basically, like I said, to our family, they'd do the same thing. We'd have, a, we'd, we'd go over, have a reading and we would, uh, and in that reading, we just kind of start talking about questions or insights that, that the group might have. And we did that in a very small capacity in Costa Rica. And, uh, and Steve took that and made it, did the same thing in tour for me. Somehow he makes it with, work with 200, 300 people. I don't, I don't get it, but, uh, he does. And it does a great job with it. Um, so, you know, it was much more of a smaller scale as far as fellowship goes for our Shabbats uh, in the Costa Rica days. And, and in Florida, we found some congregations, but again, uh, they, were, they were great congregations, but they just weren't the best fit for our children because we were looking for, for children. So now our Shabbats, uh, again, usually comprise of, uh, Torah family meets uh, twice, twice a month, um, which allows us to figure out other things to do on Shabbat that our family might want to do. And uh, so on the days that we go to Torah family, or the Shabbats we go to Torah family, we do exactly that, and it's uh, fantastic. And then after sometimes that, we end up going to someone's house and we'll fellowship and talk for to to the wee hours of the morning. Um, and then on some days when we uh, have a Shabbat that's not uh, uh, including uh, going to Torah family, uh, sometimes we'll stay home and sometimes we'll just do a brief Bible study, but sometimes we'll just literally be lazy. Like we'll just, we'll just lay around, we'll get up late and uh, we'll just spend time as a family and not really do much of anything. And sometimes for me personally, selfishly, I need that from time to time. That's when I recharge. Um, I can't always do the fellowship thing. Now my wife, Leslie, as I was kind of talking to you earlier, she needs the fellowship. And so sometimes it's just kind of finding a balance between that and the kids. They're, they're, they're both a, a mixture of us anyways, and I think that's God's intent. But, you know, sometimes they need, kind of need either or as well. But uh, a lot of times on Shabbats that don't include Torah family, we'll end up just visiting some friends and spending time with them, or, or they'll come over here and, and spend some time here. And, uh, but uh, uh, it's, it's, it's nothing that's intensely structured, uh, and I kind of like that about that, is, is we kind of just do whatever we feel like as a family we need to get do. Uh, how do we need to get into the Word, and uh, how do we need to spend time with each other, and how, more importantly, like which is the purpose of rest in a lot of ways, is or Shabbat is is the rest. We just recharge and stop. We just cease, and uh, because as busy as we tend to be, we don't appreciate that as much as I think as we should. To each his own, right? But because yeah. uh, I don't have any right to say how someone should operate their Shabbat. But I think sometimes when we structure it a little bit too much, we, we might be kind of getting further away from the point. There is a reason that the only thing that we're told to do on Shabbat is to rest. And our animals are to rest, which Shabbat was made for man, so why are animals supposed to rest? But I think that's because animals, a lot of times in the ancient Near East, were to used to help facilitate work. It's really just about mankind resting, ceasing. And, uh, and there's a reason for that. And, uh, and sometimes when we try to force things to occur, it's kind of actually getting a little bit away from that when we're trying to say, hey, we have to do this or do that. Well, the word doing is the opposite <laughs> of, of ceasing, is it not? So, so, and I get it, right? I don't want to ding anyone on that, but it just sometimes just kind of step back and look at it from that way and see if it reveals anything to you. So That's great. Well, one more, and then we'll just 
I'll ask you to talk about whatever you're working on now with 119, but anything you want to plug if you haven't already. But yeah. the last one is, oh, we've, I think it's the answer I know is dispensationalism. But <laughs> before coming into Torah, what was the biggest objection you had to it? And how did you end up changing your mind? Before coming into Torah, what was our biggest, my biggest, I, I'm, I'm, I'm used, I'm used to dealing with people's objections to the Torah, right? So I've seen every which and way someone can reject the Torah. There's nothing, nothing has surprised me. It's all happened probably a, a thousand times. But for me, I didn't have that obstacle for whatever reason. Uh, because I guess the answer is, as, as I kind of re revealed earlier in the interview, is I kind of fell into it. Like once dispensationalism eroded, that was the monument that I accidentally discarded and then Torah happened. So for a lot of people, they're getting presented Torah and that monument still exists or whatever monument it might, it might be, right? That, that obstacle is already present. I did it backwards. I got rid of the problem and then Torah happened where people so a lot of times these days we'll get presented Torah and they're like, well, how does that, how, how do I deal with this? Now, of course, when I got rid of dispensationalism in my mind, I still had to deal with certain words of Paul. But for me, it was the, the, the solution was already there. Now the problem is how do I reconcile Paul with what I had just concluded? So I kind of reverse engineered it a little bit, I guess. And not everyone goes that direction. It does, I do see it happen. But uh, again, I just kind of fell into it, I guess. So I didn't really have a lot to work through other than just the micro details of like, how does this first fit into this bigger perspe perspective of, of being Torah pursuant now. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, Paul is a big one. Is there anything else you want to talk about that you want to mention to the audience that I didn't? Uh, I would I would probably just encourage, you know, everybody that, you know, you know keep, all of us in prayer, not only one night ministries, but your families and your friends and those who are tour pursuing and who are not. They like, you know, if whatever world we're entering right now, which is just a strange world, it's not a day that goes by like you read the news and you're like, what in the world is it's like this happened in the 1980s? We all be freaking out right now, but we're, be, we're becoming desensitized. The, 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 it's like some people are familiar with the, the phrase boiling frog, right? That we're getting so used to just weird things happening that weird is the norm and a decade or two ago like if any of some of these things that we're seeing happen regard whatever it be the, these things that are censor, censorship or or a uh, thing that, that the recent thing with Israel the 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 centralization of currencies across across the world uh, the digitization of those and, and rules being attached to them that are completely combative against the Torah all these things, if these are just, if any one of those things are happening a decade ago, we would all be freaking out. We would be, but we're not. And the reason is because we're used to it and we're becoming more increasingly used to it to the point that someday we're just going to wake up, I think, and say, it's already here. How did we not see it? And so I think we're getting closer to that. And it's weird watching it all play out because a lot of us are so distracted and so busy that we don't we don't see it. So I think we need to focus. Remember, it goes back to ceasing and resting. I think part of a ceasing and resting is not so much, at least in these days, it's not so much that just so we're not doing for the sake of doing nothing. It's because when you're doing nothing, you start looking around and saying, wait, what is all this going on? What is this all around me? I'm not distracted at the moment. Now I see it. And you know, it, Shabbat gives you that advantage because when you turn off your brain, when you turn off a, a device, when you when you when you're just fo you're not focused on work and the things that you do day in and day out, you look at things and you see things that you don't always observe or realize that are there. And I, I'm saying things in a very general sense, but the reality is, is that combined with the fact that so many things are happening and accelerating so that things just might get a little weirder. And so we all kind of think, spend more time in prayer with our friends and families and just pray that we all do things that give glory to him, uh, that we don't embarrass him in any particular way, and that his will is accomplished. Which again, you know, just goes back to the Messiah's prayer, like your will be done, right? That's the whole purpose of our existence. And and uh, I think if we if we focus on that, at least occasionally, 
I think we'll do pretty well. But I'm not seeing a lot of us focus on that a lot of times. Certainly there is, and again, I speak in general terms. But I think there's a great opportunity for us to look at things from that perspective a little bit more uh, for whatever that's worth. I agree. Hunter Thompson says, when the going gets weird, the weird turn pro. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, maybe that's... That's true. <laughs> maybe that's what we're going through. That's true. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Let me, I'll let you get back to your work, and I appreciate it. Luke, it's been a pleasure. You're welcome to do this anytime. So uh, thank you for, for chatting with me today. I appreciate that. <laughs>